This morning I'm going to read from Acts chapter 21 starting in verse 27 through chapter 22 verse 21. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city of Trophimus in Ephesus, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band, that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down into them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded he was who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing, some another, among the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty of the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was, that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying, Away with him! And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness four thousand men who were murderers? But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Taurus, a city of Cilicia. Cilicia, excuse me, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with his hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in Hebrew, in the Hebrew tongue, saying, Men, brethren, and fathers, Hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he saith, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Taurus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, And was zealous toward God as you all are this day. And I persecuted this way into the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. As also the high priest doth bear witness in all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them who were bound unto Jerusalem. For to be punished. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell onto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth. Whom thou persecute. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, 
I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And that same hour I looked upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, and saw him saying unto me, Make haste, and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed in thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the remnant of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence into the Gentiles. This is the word of God. In the name of God, I take you to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. Most of us understand what I just quoted. It's traditional wedding vows from what's called the Book of Common Prayer. And I don't think we can really fathom how many millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions have uttered those words over the last 400 years, making that vow for all of life, a whole of life uh, uh, embodiment surrender to this particular union of a husband and a wife. And the key would be it is a all of life, wholly devoted vow. And last week in Acts chapter 21, verses 17 through 26, we saw that Paul, in an attempt to silence rumors about him, agreed to enter into a vow to show I'm not who you say I am, but rather I am a man wholly surrendered to God, contrary to what you say. And his vow in, in Acts chapter 21 was to be a seven day vow. But we know better that Paul's vow was for all of life. That it was to live a life wholly devoted to God. To live a life wholly surrendered to God. So then as the end of seven days was, was uh, wrapping up. Uh, and, and the time of that verbal vow and that sacred uh, devotion was to be coming to an end. He's back in the temple and people start to chatter. Religious people have a way of chattering. Don't we? And, they, and they, they begin to say things in such a way and accuse him in such a way that they knew the outcome would be this large mob, this great frenzy. And what was going to happen is as they now surround Paul, not to lift him up and celebrate, but to lay violent hands on Paul. They arrest Paul. They beat Paul. They, they get him arrested and now he's removed and it gives him the opportunity to give testimony. And in Paul giving his testimony, he reminds us of Four different aspects of what it means to be wholly devoted to God. To live a life of whole surrender to God. He reminds us of these things. And the reason why I've chosen to highlight the word remind is because, if I'm being honest, I kind of know you guys. Now, I don't know every one of you in all the same ways. I know none of you exhaustively. I don't even know my heart exhaustively. There's mystery in my heart that, profound, uh, that, that astounds me regularly, and only the Lord knows that. But I do know you. Many of you were raised in the church. Many of you have been a part of a church for a long time. You're, you're in, in some way, you're aware of Christianity. And by that, I mean, I don't think I'm going to say anything today that's going to be new. You've heard all these things before. Hence the word, a reminder. 
But I also chose the word reminder because where we are in the book of Acts, this is now the second time that Luke recorded the, uh, the conversion story of the Apostle Paul. And in fact, he's going to record it for us a third time in Acts chapter 26. Evidently, Luke wants us to know about the conversion of Paul. And each time he's building on it. Each time there's a little nuance different. But where it leaves us is being reminded. Oh, oh yeah, that's what it means. When someone becomes a follower of Jesus, that's what it means to be wholly surrendered to God. And, and perhaps again, you remember from last week in, the, in the, the life of Paul as he's being accused and these rumors are flying around, he modeled for us how to respond when your character is being assaulted. And we saw that you were to respond with humility and with love. And then as we jump now into the passage for this morning, beginning in verse 27, we see humility and love gives way to hostility and lies. That is, the, the character of the Apostle Paul and the character of the Jewish community could not stand in starker contrast than what we have right here. And so we have some Jews from Asia that they recognize Paul here in the temple and immediately they shout. They begin to stir up the crowd. They pursue Paul. They have, they're, they're saying things like, hey, hey, y'all, listen to this. We all know that guy. We've seen it. We've heard it. We know how this plays out. He has no respect for us, no respect for our customs, no respect for anything that we hold to. In fact, he's taught everyone everywhere. And now let me just pause and say, absolutely, it's not helpful to say everyone everywhere. You always, you never. Because that's just not true. And so if you lead your argument with you never or you always, you're already on the wrong foot. That's where they were. Really? He taught everyone everywhere to forsake these things? My goodness, he's standing in our temple for crying out loud. What do you mean he taught them to forsake when he ironically is now submitting and embodying obedience to the things that we say he teaches everyone everywhere to forsake? You know what happened right here? They ignored their eyes and went with their feelings. Ignored their eyes, what they see what they're hearing, what they're experiencing. And they're like, no, no, that can't be true. That is, they already had an outcome in mind. They already had a narrative they intended to, to act on, regardless of the facts. But they also assumed that Paul had violated the temple in a way of bringing this Gentile man or this Greek man in. And, uh, and Duane read for us, his name is Trophimus. The problem was he wasn't in the temple. They had seen him in town, and here you go, here's another, here's another problem. They assumed that because Paul was with Trophimus in town, that he must have brought Trophimus into this sacred space of the temple. That is, the mob was saying, you guys, ignore reality. Follow your passion. Follow your feelings. That was the plan from, of, of the Jews from Asia. And as we saw, it worked. The crowd became hostile, and they sought to kill Paul. And in this moment, we see, oh, the vow will be tested. He devoted himself to God as being consecrated, set apart for God. Let's see how that plays out for you, Paul. And so we begin reading now in verse 30 of chapter 21, verse 30. It says, then all the city was stirred up. The people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. It is God's grace that there were Roman soldiers, centurions in this city. It is God's grace that there was one of the government that was charged with keeping the peace. And as these soldiers, as this commander heard and noticed the chaos that was happening, they rush in to bring relief or to protect Paul. That is, they're protecting them all, their own selves by, by ensuring that peace would remain. And so they, they lunge forward, they surround the mob, they begin to push in and pull and shout and scream and, and maybe they whipped and maybe they punched and maybe they just acted in all these ways to say, we must get control of this moment. But the grace was, it meant Paul was not going to die on that day and that moment. But also the grace was the prophecy of Agabus previously in 21 was being fulfilled right here before their eyes as Paul was bound with two chains by Gentiles because of the hatred of the Jewish people. 
And so now with him in this moment and the tribune with him and the, and the guards around him, this tribune is shouting, you guys cut it out. What's going on right here? Tell me what's happening. Why this fuss? And it says that some in the crowd were shouting one thing and some another. They couldn't even agree on what they were upset about. Again, some things haven't changed much in the last 2000 years, has it? And in this moment, Paul was removed to a safe place. So now in verse 35, it says, when he had come to the steps, notice this moment. He was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. You want to know how severely beaten the Apostle Paul was? You want to know an aspect of being wholly devoted to God? He had to be carried up these steps. They wore him slap out. Verse 36, for the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. His devotion to God was being severely tested in this moment, beaten this badly. He couldn't even make his way up a handful of steps. And all the while, the crowd, just like they had done 30 years prior with Jesus, they're shouting, away with him. Away with him. You know, it was the Apostle Paul a few years prior to this who wrote. No, excuse me. It was right around this time. He wrote a, a letter to the church in Philippi. Where he told them about fellowshipping with Christ through suffering. Surely he knew the presence of the Lord. In the cry of this crowd at this moment. He has a recollection of the teaching of the Lord that if they persecuted the Lord, they will persecute his people away with him. And there he is united with Christ in chains with Roman soldiers all around him, a mob screaming out. He looks to be forsaken, but he's not alone. The Lord's with him. My curiosity in reading this is, boy, I wonder what James and the, and the elders of the church in Jerusalem thought about this moment. Remember, he's in this moment because of the wise counsel of these, of these Jerusalem elders. Paul, just get out ahead of this thing. Just get out ahead and do these cer certain things, and surely it will calm down the crowd. It will quiet them. But in this moment, would you agree, it looks like it backfired? But it didn't. God was doing something in this moment that I don't think any of them could even fathom in real time as the events are playing out. God is, God is doing something far beyond what they could ask or imagine. You ever wonder why there's so many promises in the Bible? You ever sit down and think, like if God promises it once, isn't that enough? Why are there so many? And you know the answer when you think about it. Because we need that many. Because <laughs> we forget And, and, and we're not just going to have one trial. It's going to be constant trial, constant testing, constant stumbling and doubting and just the sorrows of this world. Why the promise? Because we need it. It's like asking, why is there the book of Revelation in the Bible? And you know the answer. Because we need to know Jesus wins. We, we need to know that trials are ordinary. Sufferings are coming our way. They're going to be our common experience until the very end. But never doubt, O oh church, who wins in the end? It is Christ and he is vindicated and we, his church, will be vindicated along with him. And so in these moments like we have here in Acts 21, it is a kindness of the Lord that he gives us promise. It's a kindness that he tells us how this, all this plays out so, the, so that we do not despair. The sufferings are real, but the sufferings do not last. Christ is Lord. He is the King. He wins. Hallelujah. We endure. And that's where he is here in this moment. And he's giving us this opportunity to take a long view. Remember the end. Remember God really does work all things together for good. Remember God gives us the grace we need to remain steadfast under, under, trial, under, under trial. So that we do not run away. We do not doubt. We do not, we do not renounce the faith. Instead, with Paul, we trust the Lord. And we display a life wholly surrendered to God. Now, with Paul and the soldiers at the top of the steps, Paul asks if he can speak. 
And he first speaks in Greek to the amazement of the tribune, and then he speaks in Hebrew to the amazement of the crowd. And so read with me beginning in 2137. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up the revolt and led 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. So now we're in a moment of awe. Now we're in a moment of curiosity. That is, this man evidently is not the man that we thought he was. First, he's not this assassin from Egypt. He's a Jewish man. He's a Roman citizen. And oh my Lord, he speaks our language. He speaks our heart language. And so the great hush, whatever that means, became even more quiet. Whatever that means. And now they're open. Now they're willing to hear. What's he going to say? I reckon he could have apologized. I reckon he could have said, I went too far. I expected too much. Like others, I guess he could have turned. You're right, I'm sorry. I want nothing to do with Jesus. I'll fall back in line. But also he couldn't. Because he was born again, full of the Spirit, informed by the, by the Scriptures. He was a man of integrity. And we saw two weeks ago that he counted his life of, of no value as long as he was faithful to the call of Christ on his life and proclaimed that mystery of Christ. So he remained a man wholly devoted, wholly surrendered to God. Are you yet wholly surrendered to God? Well, that's an absolute question, isn't it? And it's the question we should all ask. Not just the first time at the moment of salvation, but it should probably be a a daily asking. Am I wholly surrendered to God? And so, yes, I do mean if you do not know the Lord, I mean, no offense by this question, but it is sincere. Why not? Why don't you know him? What is so dear to you that you can't fathom letting go of that and treasuring Christ above all? But if you do know Christ, do you have anything that you're keeping in your back pocket that you hope he doesn't notice? You're keeping in a closet and when you invite him into your home, you're just going to pretend like that closet door isn't there and hope he doesn't go over there and open it and look in it. Are there areas, aspects of your life that you're saying, not yet, Lord? Why? What's so wretched about Jesus that you wouldn't trust him? Well, what's so what's so off in his nature and his character that you think you know better? And your delights are better than his delights. Your wisdom exceed his wisdom. Like, I mean, it, it's, it's ridiculous. He's the only one that's good, y'all. The only one. And if his goodness is opening that closet door and seeing things that you hope nobody ever finds out about, his goodness will also be removing that and setting you free. Are you wholly surrendered to God? With what's coming in Paul's testimony, again, he's just going to remind us of what it means, what it looks like to have a whole life surrender. The first thing we need to remember is religious sincerity doesn't make us right with God. Religious sincerity, religious devotion is not what makes us right with God. So he begins in verse 3, again, in the Hebrew language, they're even more quiet. He says, I am a Jew 
born in Tar Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and old council of elders bear witness, bear, bear me witness. From them, I received letters to the brothers and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. I assure you, you and I are not more devoted to religion than the Apostle Paul was prior to his conversion. None of us is more sincere than Paul was. He says he was trained at the, at the feet or in the prestigious school of Gamaliel according to the strict manner. That is not the liberal manner, playing fast and loose with the scriptures. Just what does this mean to me? No, no. What does it mean to God? I was, I was trained in that strict manner of the law of our fathers. I wasn't lukewarm. I was zealous for God as all of you are this day. In fact, he was so zealous to his religious devotion, he said he persecuted away. He didn't sit at home and just make snarky comments. Oh boy, got up and got after it. He's out now like a hound from heaven pursuing these followers of Jesus, persecuted this way to death. He's binding and delivering to prison men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders bear witness, bear me witness. He was basically a terrorist, a Jewish terrorist wanting to destroy the way, wanting to destroy those that say Jesus Christ of Nazareth is our Messiah. He even goes so far as to say, guys, you can turn around and you can ask the priest. You can turn around, you can ask the whole council of the elders, am I lying? And if they're a man of integrity to a man, they would have had to say, he ain't lying, y'all. That's who he was. You thought your righteousness exceeded the, 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 the scribes and the Pharisees? Paul's righteousness in this moment exceeded the scribes. And the Pharisees, in Philippians 3, 6, he said, as to the law, I was blameless. Can anybody say that today? <laughs> of course not. Yet, how full is the world of religious people? You know how this goes. How many times have we heard, and maybe we've even said, that we're confident, for the most part, that we're going to heaven because... I just have more good works than bad works in my life. As if God is weighing on this great scale and, oh, you better be glad you got that one last generous effort in there because, woohoo, it was close. But you better be glad. And now it tipped the scales. You're free. Have peace. You're coming home one day. And maybe we don't say it that way. Maybe we say, well, I'm not perfect, but I'm not as bad. And we point out the worst people. Adolf Hitler and whatever else, right? Well, of course we're not that bad. But he's not the standard. Perfection is the standard. And so Paul here is saying, in some regard, you want to bring the law at me? You want to bring zeal at me? You want to have that conversation? Bring it on. Go ask your high priest. Go ask the other priest. Go ask the council of the elders. They will tell you how righteous and zealous and strict I was. But here's what Paul was doing in this moment. He's priming the pump to say, and I too needed Jesus to save me. From myself. Have you said that? The primary one you need salvation from is you. Me. I'm what's wrong with me. It's not my wife, it's not my children, it's not my upbringing, it's not, it's not the influence of this world. It is my heart that is flirting with this world. And I need to be rescued from me. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? That's what Paul asked to, to, to the church in Rome. Again, he's setting the stage here to say, you guys think you're strict. You think you're zealous. You think you're devoted. You have not exceeded me. I needed salvation. 
So he gives the testimony, and it continues here. And, and as he's now zealously traveling to Damascus to arrest more Christians, something happened to Paul. You know what happened? He met the resurrected Christ. <laughs> and everything changed in that moment. And, and he learned salvation belongs to the Lord and not to, not to Saul. And we're reminded of that this morning. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So we continue the reading here in verse 6. As I was on my way, this is Acts 22, 6. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now, those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who is speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus. And there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. Everything changed when Paul wasn't looking for it to change. Everything changed because the Lord showed up and blinded him. And for the first time, he saw the whole truth. He had to be blinded to see. And notice who blinded him. Notice who spoke to him from that light. Verse 8, he's asking, Paul, Saul is asking the question, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth. Whom you are persecuting. Now, time out. Who was he persecuting? Physically, literally. It was people on the way of Jesus of Nazareth. But the one he was ultimately persecuting, Jesus of Nazareth, is the one that is so united with his people on that way that if you persecute the people, you perse persecute Jesus himself. He's the one that suffers with the church. That he saves. So again. Jump back into this moment. Paul is being persecuted. And those people are persecuting Jesus as well. United with Christ. Is it not astounding today we are united with Christ? And nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Nothing separates us. From Jesus of Nazareth. Nothing. Nothing. Man, you think of the violent threats of the world, but you just think of a knuckleheaded dad that's impassioned and says something reckless. Nothing separates us from Christ. Once you have been united with him, sealed with the Holy Spirit, there is no separation. On behalf of sinners saved by grace, I say, thank you, Lord. Because, boy, I've tried. I've, I've tried to separate myself. Just leave me alone. Give me my way. And he's like, no. I love you too much. I would never hand you over to that. Now, don't miss this. I will discipline you. If you choose to test me. But my discipline is effective. And it produces the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who are trained by it. So listen here, old boy. You ought to listen and be trained by my discipline. Don't be stubborn. Receive my grace again. Walk in it. So here we have Paul in this perplexed moment. He's trying to make sense of what on earth just happened. Wham, the light blinded him. He falls to the ground. He's staggering. He's like, what is even happening here? Who are you talking to? Who is this? I am Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, that one. The one that was just crucified not too long ago, but the one who is alive, the one that you're, you're trying to root out of this world and those that, that confess Jesus Christ is Lord, I'm the one that's talking to you. And here's what I'm getting at. Jesus did not kill him as he deserved. You come at my family, you're going to deal with me, just so you know. And it's probably not going to be peacemaker, Pastor Eric. I'm going to match you because I'm going to protect my family. 
it makes sense for me that Jesus would level him and teach him this devastating lesson and say, no more. And if he ever got up and tried to say an utter, uh, another word about his church, just take him out of the world. Paul fell to the ground and he was broken. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Was Paul looking for it? There's this whole value of seeker sensitive. Paul wasn't seeking Jesus. I promise you that. He was seeking to root him out of this world. And the Lord showed up and blinded him with his grace. In fact, what happens in verse 14, we're going to see in just a moment, should be familiar language for us. It should remind us of a, of, a, of a previous encounter in the Old Testament where the Lord shows up in this dynamic way and it's made abundantly clear salvation belongs to the Lord. So let's keep reading in chapter 22 of Acts and see if we can pick up on some of this language. I'm going to begin reading in verse 12. One Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, that is in Damascus, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he, Ananias said, the God of our fathers appointed to you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear, the, uh, hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. The God of our fathers, verse 14, is the one who saved Paul. And this is the same language God used when he met Moses in the burning bush to announce salvation belongs to the Lord. I'm bringing you out of Egypt. I'm going to deliver you. I am the God of your fathers and I am faithful. So the God who called Moses is the God who called Paul. Now, did Moses deserve that place that title, that role, did he deserve to hear the voice of the Lord? No. Now Moses was on the run for crying out loud. And God met him in that bush and spoke that he was the God of their fathers. Now go back and set my people free. But the point is, it was God's initiative. It was God's grace not anything in Moses, not anything in Paul. And the God of our fathers that appointed Paul also, or, or, or following that out, appointed him to see the righteous one. This is the same language God spoke to Isaiah, speaking of the suffering servant, the one that was pierced for our transgressions. None other than Jesus himself. So in standing at the top of the steps and announcing this is the experience of, of meeting Jesus of Nazareth, being blinded, but then having his eyes open and being appointed to this work, he is saying, guys, I'm not walking in a new faith. I am walking in obedience to an ancient faith that has been fulfilled in none other than Jesus of Nazareth. He is Messiah. He is the fulfillment of the law. He is the fulfillment of the prophets. Jesus is the true and final prophet, priest, and king. Why do you hate me? I'm simply following this out to its scriptural conclusion here. The only reason Paul saw it. The only reason. Paul was able to know any of this. As Jesus showed up and blinded him. And in blinding him, he opened his eyes to see the truth. Not killed because of his hatred or violence, but saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Now, I assume none of us have had a Damascus Road blinding encounter with the Lord. But we need to have some sort of encounter with the Lord where he reveals our true nature and he reveals his true nature, his true glory. And we cry out with Paul in some manner, who are you, Lord? And he says back, I am Jesus of Nazareth. 
And it is my grace that you're able to hear me right now. And when it is, when salvation is of man, a fruit of that will be impatience or arrogance, condescending attitude. God, I thank you, I'm not like them. But when salvation is of the Lord, we will be humble. We will be grateful. We will be patient with one another, with one another because we'll know. We will know regularly. He did not give me what I deserve. He gave me what I could never earn. But Christ earned on my behalf. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the gift of faith. Thank you for the gift of salvation. All glory to God alone. Now, have you experienced God's grace? Now, yeah, maybe I'm speaking to you in first time. And today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off till tomorrow. The Lord is speaking right now, calling us to reconciliation with him. Do not run. Do not dismiss. But receive the mercy of God in Christ as he's making you aware of that need for salvation. And if you have received his grace and you are born again to a living hope, Worship him because of it. Give him all the praise. You are not yet what you will be in heaven. Amen? Amen. But you are not what you were when he saved you. Hallelujah. We're making progress according to his grace. So salvation from beginning to end belongs to the Lord. And we are recipients. We benefit. (laughs) That's what you do when you can't say the word, you change it. We benefit from his grace to us. And we are built up and sustained by his grace. But this flows into this next part of what's happening here, where Paul is reminding us humility comes before usefulness. So for for the Apostle Paul, the the saving grace that, that, uh, 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 that, well, saved him, and the grace that commissioned him are one and the same. It's this, it's this one package deal that happens in this moment. But in order for him to walk in or to live out this call of God on his life, he had to be humbled and he had to submit to the Lord. So in a moment when the Lord appeal, appeared, he, he showed humility by flopping, right? He's just like, whoa. But that's not where the humility ended. He, he, he moved from the confident, zealous one And this is what's lacking in some of us. To being led by the hand. Having to admit. I've been wrong. Some of us just can't say I'm sorry, can we? We can't say I'm wrong. And we spin And justify with our wit. Because some of you are smarter than me and others. And you twist and manipulate. Because you would rather be right. And come out being right. By the way, footnote one, that's just called insecurity. I said it. You would rather be right than to say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I don't know the way. Will you lead me? This is where Paul is. God doesn't always humble us in this manner, but hear this. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And I can say with absolute confidence, if you know Christ... God's will for you is humility. It's a fruit, it's a mark, an evidence of being born again. So Ananias, in verse 16, says something to Paul. 
that I am sure needs to be said in this context this morning. Look at verse 16. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So before Paul could leave and begin to follow out this worldwide mission of Jesus Christ to take his gospel to the Gentiles, he had to submit himself to believers' baptism by immersion. He had to publicly unite himself with Christ, thus freely, publicly confessing, are you ready for this? Jesus the Christ, he is Lord. You think of the staggering humility from this man that persecuted this way just hours before is now saying, I was wrong. My zeal for God was an ignorant zeal. I was wrong. I will go public with my faith in Jesus Christ. And the public pronouncement of faith is nothing other than baptism. Having sins washed away as you call upon the name of the Lord, being buried in that water. That confession, that activity is what triggered zeal in Paul. This is what what drove him mad and he had to persecute those on the way. And now we find him uniting with Christ, uniting with the people he went there to arrest. He said that he approved of their killing. And now he's saying, I'm willing to be killed for the Lord Jesus Christ. The two questions that Paul asked of Jesus are the two questions we all ought to ask. Who are you, Lord? Verse 8, verse 10. What shall I do, Lord? To catch a glimpse of Christ's glory and power triggered these types of questions but also to catch a glimpse of the glory of Jesus and the power, the authority of Jesus trigger hatred or humility. There really is no indifference. And for Paul, it turned him. First in hatred, I've got to stomp it out. But then he saw the truth and it turned him back to humility. Have you humbled yourself before God today? I'm grateful for the Holy Spirit's work in your life and you humbled yourself before the Lord in 1982 and 1993 and then 2014. And what I'm grateful, I'm asking about this morning. Have you humbled yourself before the Lord today? I am sure that the Lord is saying to some of us, whether it be about being born again or whether it be about this next aspect of what it means to be wholly surrendered to the Lord, I am sure, as the Lord through Ananias said to Paul, the Lord is saying to some of us today, and now, why do you wait? Why do you wait? Why do you wait? The Lord's been sowing something in your heart for days, weeks, months, maybe years. An aspect of obedience, an aspect of surrender, an aspect of generosity, an aspect of kindness, an aspect of reconciliation. And you just keep finding convenient reasons to not deal with it today. Why do you wait? So husbands, are you the spiritual leader of your home? I don't care about your title. I talk about your activity. Are you the spiritual leader modeling Christ in your home? Why do you wait? Parents, grandparents. Reading the scriptures, discipling your children in the Lord. Why do you wait? Your neighbor that you know is perishing and will not be saved apart from calling on the name of Christ. How will they call upon him of whom they've never heard? Why do you wait? There's a strained relationship and there's a distance that hasn't always been there, but now it's there. And you're just like moving away and you're like, fine, they don't want to be that way. I'm just going to move on. Why do you wait to be reconciled? 
Because when you ask, who are you, Lord, and what have you called me to do? He's going to say, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was crucified and risen. I am the one who has all authority on heaven and earth. This is what I've called you to do. Walk in it. For Paul, baptism. For some of you, baptism. Stop making excuses and walk in obedience, being wholly surrendered to God. For some of you, it's learning to say, I'm sorry. For some of you, it's learning to say, I forgive you. Why do you wait? And I think part of the reason we wait is what we see here with this fourth reminder, what Paul models for us here. God's plans, God's plans for us matter more than our perspective. We don't see how this is going to play out. Well, we ain't doing it, Lord. So Paul, after he rises and is baptized, he has his sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. He shares about a temple experience, a time when he was in the temple praying and that the Lord came and ministered to him. And so we read in verse 17 and following. He says, when I had returned to Jerusalem, that is from Damascus, and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So remember, all of this started uh, um, um, when Paul was accused of defiling the temple. And he includes this encounter in his public testimony now in the temple to say, defile the temple. I've never defiled the temple. The times I came here was to pray and was to worship the Lord. And then he gives us a, a, a summary of a moment that's similar to Isaiah's calling where the Lord showed up, met with Paul, revealed his glory and commissioned him to go and do something. And Paul is saying, hey, y'all, I know your story. As happened to Isaiah, it happened to me. There's continuity in this faith. And Isaiah was told, they're not going to listen to you, but you need to stay in the city. Paul was told, they're not going to listen to you. You need to leave the city. And Paul acted just like Moses. And he began to argue back now, objecting to God's will, God's plan. And Paul reasoned he was actually going to be safer in the city than out among these scattered Jews, because the whole reason they were scattered was Paul. Wait a minute, Paul. You chased me out of the city, and now you, you're going to come to me, and you just want me to hug you and welcome you? <laughs> Bet. That's what Paul is saying, and that makes perfect sense to us, right? Like, if, if, if you've had a violent parent, whack! You start to brace yourself, right? So when they come with a hug, you're like, ah, I know what that feels like. That's what Paul is thinking here. God, you want me to go where and do what? No, there's no way this is going to play out well. He's arguing back with God and the Lord answers back. He is adamant. Go. For I will send you far away to the Gentiles. By the way, if, if if you are a violent parent or grandparent, repent right now in Jesus' name. I do not want to make light of that. Repent of that now and be reconciled to Christ. As we're going to see next week, this story that Paul tells gets the mob all hot and bothered again. It erupts and away with him indeed. God's will for us, this is what I want us to know. God's will for us many times does not align with our plans or ambitions. Can we agree to that? So what do we do? Whatever God has said. It is that simple. God has spoken. It is finished. Walk in it. Even if it doesn't make sense to you, yet. He has spoken. It is finished. Walk in it. So we're not all called to be missionaries to the unreached peoples of the world. Amen? But not a one of us has been called to live a selfish life. Amen? So we want to we make excuses of why we're not doing that while we embody the one thing that is crystal clear. 
If you're going to follow Christ, you take up your cross, you die to who? I forgot. Self. You are not the Lord. I am not the Lord. Jesus is, and he's given us instruction. He's given us commission, appointed us to certain tasks. And yet what, what's hard is that many of us are just like these first century Jews, comfortable being God's chosen people. While the world all around them was in shambles and perishing. We're just too comfortable in an unholy way with the benefit of belonging to Christ. And we're selfish. And we're missing out on the blessing of being a useful vessel of God's love and grace to this world. Check this out. The Lord's going to save some people in Phoenix Metro today. Hallelujah, right? Like he's going to give new life and people will be united with Christ. Their chains will fall off. Hallelujah for his grace. And the people that are obeying Christ and being messengers of Christ will not go home miserable. They'll go home full of joy, free. The Lord used me. We're missing out on that. That joy of obedience and being used by God because we're so comfortable that we're the chosen people. And I hope the Holy Spirit with holy irritation, pokes us this morning. And he says, why do you wait? Why do you wait? I am saving people in this community. I am reconciling people in this community. I am setting people free in this community. Why do you wait to get onto this? Why do you remain as a bystander off to the side? Off to the side? Why are you waiting and it's taking a toll on you? I know how miserable you are. I know you grumble and complain. I know you're paranoid. I know you're anxious. I know you get upset when things don't go your way. But there's a better way. It's called the way of the Lord. It's called the way of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Do you? you realize joy is experienced in submitting and trusting. You don't get joy and then you go submit. You submit and the fruit, what comes to you is joy and peace. You're like, oh Lord, give me peace. He's like, take a step and I will. And you're like, no, I don't have peace yet. And he said, you won't ever have peace until you take a step. Take a step. And those of us who have taken steps, we say, take the step, right? Peace, fullness of life in Christ, not in the sideline, but in Christ, being wholly surrendered. It's what David Platt said 15 years ago, 10 years ago, write a blank check to the Lord. Just sign it and trust him to fill in how much and where. So if you ask those two questions, who are you, Lord? And what shall I do, Lord? He will make it plain. And if you linger, he will say to you and to me, why do you wait? And there won't be a good answer. There's not a good answer. So I want to go back to where we started as we wrap up and you guys can Start making your way up here. And I want to reread something. And I want to say it a little differently. And maybe for you, it's a first time. Maybe for you, it's the tenth time. Maybe it's like a 50th wedding anniversary and a vow rededication. Listen to this. In the name of God, I confess Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. From this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, knowing that we will never be parted by death, this is my solemn vow. Will you say that? Will you walk in that? Let's pray. Well, Father, we do surrender to you.
as a church, we surrender all to you. And Lord, we pray that all the members of our church body will join in that collective surrender. We surrender, I surrender all. That we don't surrender contingent upon somebody else's obedience, but we say, here am I, Lord. Do to me according to your will. I will not wait another moment. Father, we pray that uh, where reconciliation among brothers and sisters is needed, you would bring it about for your glory. And so show us that humility comes before usefulness. And that where our perception is, is off, that we would conform to you. Walk in the way that you've called us to. And we know that way is to make disciples. We know that way is to bear with one another, is to pray for one another, to encourage one another. Even as that passage in Hebrew says, encourage because we're not forsaking to gather together. We will walk in that God. And so we're, we're, we're writing a church check and it's blank, but it's signed by us as a church do to us according to your word. And so have your way with us. For the unity within the fellowship and the fruits in this community. Thank you for the brothers and sisters that are serving us this morning in the various ways. May they be blessed and encouraged. Thank you for the brothers and sisters that can't be with us. And we pray that we go to them now. For those members that are sick or are injured or those that are traveling or or maybe sleeping, that we go and minister grace to them. And give us eyes to see and ears to hear the people of this community. And may we witness the goodness of God in Christ. And call them to join with us in loving, trusting, treasuring Jesus above all. Our eyes are on you because we do trust you. Hallelujah. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.